Uh, so for the recording, I'm just going to back up. Um, so good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, we have previously um, gone through the list of members and, assume, and uh, checked off that all members are present um, and officials and consultants are present as well. I uh, have read through the introductory remarks. Um, uh, so for this meeting, um, so this meeting was originally intended to be a, a Zoom webinar on the account that we have been using for deliberations in the past. Um, unfortunately, that account is the same account that the select board uses for their meetings. And uh, so they have priority over us for that account. Um, and so they are using that right now. So for that reason, we had to effectively shift rooms to the room we're in now, um, which is uh, not a webinar room. However, the, the reasons for using the webinar room, which I will review in a minute is essentially because after the close of the public hearing on a 40B or comprehensive permit uh, case, the board is not allowed to take additional testimony uh, from any parties, both um, from the applicant side, from the town side, our consultants, the public, we are limited to the information that has come before us during the open hearing. And so, this evening, that rule still applies, um, even though we are in a different format. So I really ask everyone's indulgence to please, um, you know, that, that we need to limit the conversation as to what goes on tonight to just the members of the board and not to open that up to the outside. Um, so before I move us on to uh, the meeting of tonight's um, meeting, I do see, I do have one hand up from the public. Um, so I will go ahead and take that question so long as it relates to the format of the meeting rather than to the, the content of the meeting. Mr. Rarick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It does indeed relate to the, to the mechanics of the meeting. Um, I wanted to first remind you to uh, start recording um, and then, um, to let you know that the uh, uh, email had come through to me at least um, um, from Julie Wayman uh, with the correct link. <clears throat> so thank you for uh, um, for for getting that done. Thank you very Success much. Successful. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, there's no one else in the waiting room right now. Okay. So with that, we'll move on to uh, the sole item on our agenda this evening, um, which is the uh, resumption of the discussion of the, the decision on the comprehensive permit for Thorndike Place. So at our October 20th, 2021 public hearing, the board voted unanimously to close the public hearing for Thorndike Place. This marked the end of the acceptance of testimony and new information in regards to the project. It also initiated a 40-day period for the board to consider and render a decision. On October 28, 2021, the board initiated its deliberations. They were continued on November 3rd, 11th, 16th, and 18th, and we are continuing them again this evening. Tonight's discussions and deliberations are being held openly and publicly, but the board is unable to accept comment from the applicant, the board's peer review consultants, the town, or the public. For this reason, tonight's meeting would usually have been held using the webinar platform, which allows the board to limit who may participate in the discussion. Um, on behalf of the board, I appreciate everyone's understanding and everyone's cooperation in maintaining that same rule this evening. Uh, the board will resume its discussion using the draft decision available on tonight's agenda. It can be differentiated by the text in the footer noting an 11 18 20 run revision date. And the board will briefly review the revisions proposed at the previous meeting and resume the discussions. At the end of tonight's meeting, the board may either vote on the final decision or vote to continue the meeting to continue its deliberations. Under state regulations, the board must issue a decision by November 30th or request an extension from the applicant to further continue its deliberations. With that, Um, 
that Go ahead and share my screen. And so Rick, while I have the screen up, I may not be able to follow when new participants are coming into the waiting room. If you could keep an extra eye out for that for me. I, I am, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm on it. Thank Great, you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so this is, um, so this is effectively the same document that's on the uh, website. It does have some additional proposed edits, which um, I have added based on um, my further reading of the decision again today and some additions that um, at the end of the prior meeting we had requested members of the board to submit. Um, but any changes are marked as changes. So we had so last time we had gone through all of the findings. We had identified some that needed revision, um, and we had also talked again about the conditions and about the waivers. And so um, tonight, I was just going to go ahead and run down the whole document from beginning to end, capturing everything that we have um, noticed and proposed for change, and we'll, we'll just go through those. So up here at the top, nothing has changed. Um, one question I had for Mr. Haverty on number three, there's a complete listing of all of the dates of the public hearings. And I wasn't sure if we needed to add the dates of the deliberation to that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you don't need to list the dates of the deliberations. Okay. Those go away. Um, on number six, um, there are, there's one or two places in the document where we're still referring to the parcel as the Mugar property. So I thought it was important that we include a reference as to what we mean when we say Mugar property. Does that seem a fair assessment? Okay, go ahead and accept that. Uh, number 12, um, it's just being more specific about when the board had requested the applicant consider reintroduction of the duplex units. So we had said spring, but it was actually, April is a more, um, a more appropriate term. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that. That, and then this next one, uh, there was an extra space in the sentence in the paragraph, sorry. So go ahead and accept that one as well. Uh, which takes us through the first set, then we're into the jurisdictional findings. Adding a change there, no. And then the factual findings, so this is the, the main portion of the findings. Um, things on the location, description item 21. Um, so this is the paragraph that outlines how we are going to be treating the rest, how we're going to be um, organizing the discussion of the rest of the findings. Um, and so uh, Mr. Hanlon had recommended a change to the flooding and wetlands. Um, so it had read the neighborhood of the proposed project is subject to severe and repeated flooding and much of the property subject to the application consists of wetlands subject. And then he's recommending a change to the neighborhood of the approved project, which is how it's referenced in the rest of the uh, document 
experiences severe and repeated flooding and much of the property consists of wetlands subject not only to state regulation. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I just want to hasten to assure people that it's called the approved project because if we approve this decision, it will become the approved project. If we didn't approve it, then of course it would be the rejected project. So uh, the use of the word approved project here is just based on the posture of the, of the thing. It doesn't have any, it, it is not intended to um, give any hints as to where we're going. So nobody should go out and buy stock based on this. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions on this from the board? None, go ahead and accept that. And then G on open space and property management. Um, I would just was going to change uh, just capitalized conservation parcel because it is a def it becomes a defined term in the document. Uh, Twenty two need for affordable housing. Uh, one important indication of the shortfall in affordable housing. I think it's more proper than of affordable housing. Shortfall in rather than shortfall of. Anybody have a? <laughs> um, and then farther down, the state subsidizing has an inventory for which the town is at 5.64% as of 2016. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I wonder whether we should just say was there. It seems odd to say is and then have a date from five years ago. So Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, in order to clarify that, you might want to state that the uh, town subsidized housing inventory as of the date of the filing of the comprehensive permit application was at 5.64%. So that clarifies why we're using the 2016 date. And then you could probably get rid of the as of 2016. Yeah. So one important indication of the shortfall in affordable housing in Arlington is the percentage of low and moderate income units as compared to the state subsidized housing inventory as of the date of the comprehensive permit application was at 5.64%. So let me go ahead and accept that and just see what it looks like. As compared to the state subsidizing housing term, as of the day the comprehensive permit application. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. After inventory, um, perhaps insert the word wit. It seems like we're missing a word. Inventory, which as of the date. As such? Uh, looks fine to me. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I was feeling a little stunted there. Um, not sure why it's flagging something in this sentence. Might have been an extra space or something originally. Um, 24. Additional hundred and four units of senior housing. Not sure. Again, not sure why. Brings us up to the flooding and wetlands section. Um, 
25 is okay, 26. Uh, we're just clarifying when the Weston and Sampson Memorandum was prepared, which is January 2021. On behalf of the Land Trust. And then uh, um, Mr. Hanlon, we're keeping the um, the footnotes, correct? Ones okay. that are still in here, yeah. Okay. Uh, 27, in response to the board's request on October 4th, 2021, the applicant's engineer, John Hessian, submitted a memorandum on flooding mitigation measures, summarizing the evidence in the record on which the project would exacerbate the flooding in the, that the surrounding community experiences already. The board asks its peer review consultants beta group to review the applicant's conclusions. This peer review fl flood, not floor, but flood mitigation memorandum was received on October 8th, 2021. So this just clarifies which documents we're referring to um, in this same, but we're not changing the meaning of it at all. That's sub A. Um, so the set, this first sentence here in red, this is a question that we had, um, just wanted to make sure that we sort of we're certain that we won't had wanted to include all this. And we had, were curious as to whether we had a specific reaction from beta group in response to this question, which we do not have. Um, we have a response to the, the document in general, but not to this one specific point. Um, and then I was just gonna change part to portion. So only a, a very small portion of the project area currently drains. Except that, I'll also change the color of that back. And then if I change that, change. Okay. And this has, again, this has. A footnote, which we had previous. The, the, none of the footnotes have been accepted yet. So that's just why they're all flagged. They're not changed specifically from before, but they just have never been accepted. So go ahead and do that. Two. And then B, the project area experiences stream flooding as well. Um, this last sentence, it was recommended by um, Mr. Hanlon that we included, instead of being in the paragraph itself, that we included as a footnote. Do I have that correct? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Any question about that? Accept that. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, oh, never mind. It's okay. I withdraw. This is. This is times New Roman 10. This should be times New Roman 10. Okay. Um, so this is the same section under E. Um, the NOAA 14 data was requested by the commission, but it was also requested by the board. So I wanted to make sure to clarify that. And under F, the board takes note of the observations of the applicant's engineer. Construction of the project may provide an opportunity for the town to clear its existing easement of vegetation and increase the capacity of the municipal stormwater system to reduce the likelihood of, of localized flooding in the future. And then there's a request in the footnote that stormwater management and um, standards should be 
Should this second management be capitalized as well? Chairman, I think it should. That was my recommendation. Okay. Anyway. So do both of them. All right. This brings us down to 29. Uh, added a comma for clarity. So 32, 34, 35 brings us to the climate change and resiliency section. Here, footnote. Jim. Yes, sir. Um, it would just, I think it would be probably better if mm -hmm. back when the Weston and Samson memorandum first came up, we just put parentheses around, around it and said the Weston and Samson memorandum. And then every time it comes up afterwards, you can just say the Weston and Samson memorandum and not have, and you don't have to recite it um, completely. Is that something we want to go back and I, I think that I, mean, I would say that correcting that is something you could just do administratively. Okay. So at number 40, um, it's just changing apartments to senior living, building, and duplexes. Uh, so it includes everything involved in the project. Here, the key issue is whether the project design is sufficient to protect the persons and property of residents of the proposed senior living building and duplexes, as well as neighbors. And then just wanted to clarify for um, for people who can read, who might be reading this who are not um, as familiar with the terms. Um, so the site engineer provided calculations showing the imposition of the new basements into the water table would not cause any mounding or raised elevation of groundwater. And that's just to clarify the meaning of mounding in this case. And then it brings us to its net zero policy. Uh, in February 2021, the town adopted a net zero action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible and remove or offset any remaining pollution by 2050. And I believe, Mr. Hanlon, that's to adopt the same language as in the net zero action plan. Oops, you're on mute, sir. That's correct. The language comes directly from the plan. Um, and then down in 45 was just the addition of a comma after hearing. Brings us to the traffic and transportation section. Uh, so Mr. Section Chairman. Yes, Mr. Mills. Um, section 47, line, the last line. Yep. I think it needs the word for between has and the. I think it helps it read better. Board hopes, however, the applicant will approach the duplexes with the same enlightened perspective and perspective as it has for the senior housing. Thank you very much for that. Uh, 48. Um, so just including a little bit more context to some of these and including some distances. So the approved project enjoys relatively convenient access to the AOYF MBTA station at 0.7 miles, the Minuteman bikeway at 0.4 miles, and to several bus routes 0.3 miles to Route 2, 0.6 miles to Mass Ave. Any objection to that? No? Excellent. Go. Oh, 
an effect on the roadway network. Here. Again, here's a wow. bunch of footnotes. And then down here, uh, VAI reports calculated queuing lengths of one to four vehicles. Residents testify to much longer queues today. And just today doesn't really help. So the request was to remove that word. And it's 62, uh, adding a couple of commas. So feel free to take the position in a 40B case where it must, comma, as a matter of law, comma, give heavy weight to the regional need. Uh, and then incremental impact. end of 65. In essence, Lake Street is so severely impaired that the additional traffic generated by the approved project has little additional impact, as opposed to has little impact on the extent of the crisis. So I think that's better. Mm -hmm. we'll less. Uh, that's 66. 66A um, was originally not surprisingly the queuing data and just changing it to the queuing data. And accepting footnotes. Seven, we added here a footnote. No, can accept footnote. Then C16 is again adding a footnote. That footnote is down here. And then we have this table, which I guess we did not. Accept yet, so I accept the table. Let's see why it's not popping in right. All right, come back for that. Uh, effect on quality of life. In 70, we're just changing paddle tennis to pickleball. And down to proposals to address traffic impacts. Here we just added the underline. Other change. So 74 is a new paragraph. Um, so it was recommended by the Arlington Transportation Advisory Committee in its report dated January 6, 2021. The board finds that due to the traffic impacts on the neighborhood streets between Lake Street and the project location, particularly Little John Street, Northeast. Dorothy Road and Birch Street, a post-development monitoring study is necessary to identify whether future traffic calming measures are needed to mitigate impacts on the neighborhood streets and what measures would be desirable. Um, so this was something that, that the Transportation Advisory Committee that TAC had recommended um, the board uh, consider. Is there anyone on the board has a question about that? Proposed finding? Nope. Neighborhood compatibility. We get down to 78. Uh, senior living building would be among the largest apartment developments in Arlington and one of the few, if not the only one, 
not connected to a collector or arterial street without the need to access a local residential street network. Any question about that one? No. Seventy nine. So this is a essentially a replacement of what was here before. So what was here before is now in strike through. And so the revised, the proposed text is properties located within the planned unit development PUD zoning district. In this district, duplexes are allowed as of right, and a multifamily housing building is conditionally allowed. The height of the proposed buildings would be within the limits allowed in the PUD district. The duplexes at three stories and 38.13 feet from the first floor elevation to the ridge are a little taller than the buildings on neighboring properties, especially those on the other side of Dorothy Road which are subject to height limits of 2.5 stories and 35 feet. The duplexes have reintroduced to the project plan, were reintroduced to the project plan at the request of the select board and have generally been well received by abutters and other neighbors. The duplexes serve as a buffer between the lower density residential neighborhood and the higher density senior residential building. Their height by better concealing the senior residences actually makes the duplexes more effective in their buffering function. Any question about what the intent of this is? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. The only part I'm a little uncomfortable with is the comment uh, on that they were well received by abutters and other neighbors. I, I don't know if I'm comfortable saying that um, or if we need to. Um, so I wonder if we should stop that sentence as uh, serve as a buffer. Um, between the low density and the higher density senior level. I'll just stop it at the request of the select board. I welcome others' thoughts. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I don't have any difficulty with that. I mean, actually, what the truth of the matter is, is that the majority sentiment on the testimony we got was let's have the duplexes and not have the senior residences, right. which is a particularly good buffering function but um i mean nobody nobody thought that the senior residents nobody that i can remember thought that the senior residences were fine because they were adequately buffered by the duplexes right you put a period here and then strike the remainder is that Is that what you're recommending, Mr. O'Rourke? Yes, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board on this one? Nope. Let's go ahead and accept this. Okay, number 80. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, addition. I don't remember exactly where how the additions on this came about. Um, so I think the red was the purple. I think was there initially, and the red was added in. That's correct. Okay, and so. Um, so the neighborhood's concern includes not only the size of concerns, I guess the concerns at this point, include not only the size of the proposed structures, but the activities that will be associated with those structures. In finding 71, Tyler de Reuter, Beta's traffic engineer, calculated that the daily traffic generated by the current neighborhood was 2276 trips, and the additional traffic expected from the project would be for 12 trips, or approximately 18% more. And then I was going to recommend adding the homeowner at the corner of Dorothy and Little John noted his front door camera reported around 50 vehicle trips past his house on an average day. So the additional anticipated trips would increase that number eightfold. The board has received testimony. The neighborhood today is very quiet and that children can safely play in the streets. Pickleball court was created on Little John Street adjacent to Dorothy Road. Some residents fear that the greatly increased activity associated with the final proposed project will adversely affect safety in the established quality of life in the neighborhood. Do you have any questions or concerns about that? 
on. All right. Go ahead and lock that one in. Eighty one. Um, so we originally had had some um, information regards to parking. So this is just being brought um, up to here. The applicant originally proposed 315 parking spaces for the project, ratio of 144 per unit. Applicant subsequently reduced the parking ratio to 193 spaces or approximately 1.12 per unit. The applicant's final project design provides 95 parking spaces, 84 garage parking spaces, and 11 surface parking spaces. I'm going to change this comma to semicolon. Um, actually, it should be a colon, not a semicolon. Uh, the parking garage will include 10 EV charging stations with an additional 10 EV ready parking spaces as shown on the project plans. The parking garage will provide for eight handicapped parking spaces as well as two surface parking spaces designed for handicapped parking as shown on the approved plans. Projects duplex units will have tandem parking to accommodate two vehicles per unit with the exception of the Eastern end unit, which will have a single parking space. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. So is EV a term of art that everyone will understand or does that need, is that defined anywhere else? Does it say electric vehicle anywhere else or? If that's what it stands for, um, that's that is what it stands for. I don't know that we specifically. Um, no, but we can certainly do that. And then I just wanted to change this one sentence around. So the applicant's final project design provides ninety-five parking spaces for the senior living building. 84 garage parking spaces and 11 surface parking spaces. Okay, I think that reads a lot better. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Mills. Uh, what's with the hyphen between EV and ready? Is that? Um, I think it's just saying that there are spaces that they're gonna, they would be, they would not have the EV charging devices installed, but they would be created in a way that they could readily have the, that equipment installed. I, I was simply asking why the, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any further questions or comments on paragraph 81? Looks good. All right. Go ahead and accept that. Before we go any farther, I'm just going to quickly Save this. Okay. Uh, 82, the applicant did not originally propose bicycle parking. The applicant's final proposed project design includes 28 covered secured bicycle parking spaces accessible from the front of the senior living building. There's a possible expansion area for eight additional bicycle parking spaces within the senior residential parking garage. Outside the main entrance of the senior living building, the applicant will provide an additional two bike racks capable of securing six bikes apiece. Question about that one. Done. That's that. Brings us up to construction impacts. Um, so I had originally brought this forward. This was a finding we had elsewhere. Um, but, um, Mr. Handlin pointed out to me that we actually have this currently as a footnote elsewhere. Um, and so we don't actually need to include it as a footnote. Um, and he also nicely pointed out that 80, the next one, which was originally 84, was kind of long and we could split it into two. And that would preserve the numbering so that the numbering wouldn't get messed up going beyond that. Um, so that's what I've gone ahead and done here. Uh, so this part of 83 is the, was the first half of 84 and now 84 is the second half of the original 84.
Oop, what did it just do? Give that to me. Okay, so 85. Um, so we had, we're looking to make some con, add some information regarding um, staging. And so I'm not sure this is fully yet in the form of a finding. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I wrote it as a condition, not a finding. So it oh, okay. Really it. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, and all should be all. <clears throat> yeah. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, so it would be pretty easy to begin by saying uh, construction staging, specifically for the modular units, but for other units as well. Uh, has a high uh, has a, it poses a high risk of disturbance in the residential neighborhood. Mr. Chairman, if I could, I have a, okay, that's good. Mr. Chairman, we might continue on here and say uh, that the applicant has repeatedly informed the board that staging would take place off-site at several miles distance. from the project, period. The applicant has also advised the board that offloading would take place on the subject property. And Mr. Chairman, I would say the board finds that these measures are important in reducing the construction impact on the neighborhood, period. I would stop there, but you know, when we get to putting a condition in, we could go back to the language that didn't make it in. That's really the, con the condition language and we could deal with it there. Okay, so construction staging specifically for the modular units, but applicable to all, put all that in there but applicable to all other aspects of construction, pose a high risk of disturbance in the residential neighborhood. The 25 foot width of the local streets makes navigation of the neighborhood challenging, especially in the presence of parked cars. The applicant has repeatedly informed the board that staging would take place offsite at several miles distance from the project. The applicant has also advised the board that offloading would take place on the subject property. The board finds that these measures are important in reducing the construction impact on the neighborhood. 
So, does that sound to everyone? Mr. Chair. Mr. Revelak. A small suggestion. Um, in the second line, uh, perhaps in place of disturbance in the residential neighborhood, disturbance to the residential neighborhood. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Since we're doing this one a little on the fly, I'd like to make sure that I mean, we have not, not had the occasion to dive into the tapes, uh, but I would like to have my colleagues reflect that their recollection of what we were told is the same as mine. Now, that's definitely what I recall as well, because I remember there was a I remember specifically a question about whether trucks would be parked on the street while they were offloading. We were told no, that they would be offloaded from the site, particularly because the construction would be taking place farther back on the site and they wouldn't be able to access it from the street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Are we all set with that one? See nothing else, I'll go ahead. Accept that one. Okay. 86, construction of the project is expected to take 12 to 18 months. Um, so I know we had had a, a different figure here before. There was some discussion back and forth between what construction is just the assembly of the, the modular units and what is the actual project site entirety. And so 12 to 18 months was a number that was provided to the board. Um, in the course of its deliberation. So that's where that number is coming from. Uh, 87, 88, 89. <coughs> um, so this is in regards to um, uh, noise abatement and hours of operation. So the town's noise abatement bylaw allows construction activities between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. on weekdays. 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Local residents expressed considerable concern regarding what could be relentless construction without any quiet days. It was considerable interest in eliminating weekend work even at the expense of a longer work schedule. The applicant was interested in starting weekday work earlier than allowed by the bylaw. This would provide the opportunity to have the workers arrive on site early before traffic would make commuting difficult. They agreed to no Sunday or holiday hours if they could start weekdays earlier. The board found this compromise acceptable and has incorporated these hours into the conditions. The board will also need to provide a waiver, which that is parenthetical because we have done that. So I just want to see if this met everyone's approval. I think there was a little question as to whether there will, we do have a formal, whether there was a, any kind of a formal agreement made during the hearings or whether it was just something that was discussed. Mr. Chairman. Hanlon. My recollection is that it was, there was no handshake because we don't do handshakes anymore. Um, but, and it was certainly discussed with a view towards working out an, an acceptable arrangement. I don't necessarily believe that everybody who was watching us that night is bought into the, um, to the exception. Uh, but at least I thought that the clear gist of it was that uh, the sort of trade-off here was something that was with both sides in a better position uh, than just following the bylaw would. If I change that to, they could be amenable to no Sundays or holiday hours if they could start weekdays earlier. Does that sound more appropriate, more accurate? I don't know. I, I, I felt that the applicant was pretty clear, but, but that would be fine. I, I'm, Maybe we could go back to the, I could say they were amenable to. I believe that that is the case. There was, okay. a, there was a considerable amount of discussion about Saturdays <clears throat> where I don't think that an agreement was actually reached, but Sunday and, and holidays uh, did not seem to, as I recall, it did attract uh, much, much opposition from the applicant. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, that is my recollection as well. Thank you both. Mr. Chair, I concur too. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Anything further on 89? Go ahead and lock that in. Number 90. Um, 
I'll go ahead and read this one because it's kind of long. In the course of the public comment period, many a butter, uh, come up here, I think it's just singular. Uh, many butters and local residents expressed their significant concern in regards to the effects of the construction activities would have on their neighborhood. These concerns included blockage of streets by construction vehicles, traffic made worse by construction vehicles, contractor parking, storage of construction materials, and the unloading of construction materials. Additional concerns included what specific routes the contractors and construction delivery vehicles would take to the site and at what time those deliveries would occur so as to minimize impacts on local traffic. There were also concerns raised in regards to noise, dust, and vibration emanating from the site during construction, construction causing damage to their homes, damage to street trees, damage to local roadways, damage to the wetlands, and damage to local wildlife. Other construction-related issues that were raised involved pest control, light emanating from the site during construction, what dates construction would begin and end, along with what would be the days of the week and times work on the site would be allowed. Several parties were anxious about the safety of the neighborhood children during construction, especially on the weekends. The butters and local residents made it known they need to be informed and receive satisfactory responses to these questions and concerns. Furthermore, they expressed the need to know whom to contact if they require further information involving the construction or whom to contact if they observe issues and wish to notify someone or make a complaint. Any questions or comments on that one? That's pretty, pretty forceful and very accurate. I think I'll go ahead and accept that one. It's the open space and management of con con the conservation parcel. This is effectively as it was last time. Um, so 98, we had a placeholder before about adding a paragraph about wildlife. Um, so the proposed paragraph is the property provides significant wildlife habitat. On a number of occasions, members of the public have articulated their view of the critical importance of not only maintaining habitat, but of enhancing and creating additional habitat, particularly in the open space parcel. They describe the diversity of wildlife that they have observed and provided photographs, including water of waterfowl and deer. In its August 5th, 2020 letter to the Department of Planning and Community Development, Beta stated that wildlife habitat is of significant interest to the town. They indicated the property would be expected to support numerous urban species, such as common resident birds, raccoons, fox, squirrel, chipmunk, skunk, possum, deer, and rabbits. They recommended that the applicant conduct a wildlife habitat evaluation. The applicant's consultant, BSC Group, performed an evaluation on October 27, 2020. BSC observed several species, including rabbit, squirrel, presumed coyote, and a variety of passerine birds. In its report entitled Wildlife Habitat and Vegetation Evaluation dated November 2020, confirmed Beta's assessment that the property would be expected to serve as habitat for other human adapted or human tolerant species. BSC also noted that the habitat, especially in the open space parcel, had been degraded by dumping of waste, including concrete and macadam, and the accumulation of trash and debris, as well as from the encampment of homeless people. The inference may be drawn that the cleanup of the area and the cessation of human habitation will significantly improve the wildlife habitat. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, where you stumbled a little bit in reading is the, in the beginning where it says in its report entitled wildlife habitat confirmed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that somehow what started off being a long prepositional phrase it, it turned into the subject of the sentence and but there isn't really a subject so i would say that we could probably fix that easily by just saying that um beta's report entitled and then go from there just get rid of the preposition no no i'm talking about down further in the four lines for, yeah right after right before the november <laughs> i tried yes there all right so you want to I would just simply say beta's report beta's report entitled and it's, then off you go that's all you need it's not beta's report it's bsc's report oh good yeah, that's right that's and, right and i think for convention instead of having uh quotes i think we're using italics on the titles ah, to okay. reports okay. let's do that 
put that in italics. Um, so should I leave it as its or should I change this to BSCs? Well, the reason I suggested BSCs is that it's a fairly long way from the subject of the preceding sentence so that mm -hmm. it kind of is helpful to know what it refers to, but it doesn't matter if you could do either one. But I would take out the in, that's the most important thing. BSC's report tell wildlife habitat and vegetation evaluation dated November 2020 confirmed beta's assessment the property will be yada yada yada. Okay. Further comments or questions on that paragraph? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, go ahead and accept that. Move it to 99. Um, so in alignment with prior attestations, the applicant has proposed that the portion of the property outside the development area shown on the plans is containing approximately 12 acres, the conservation parcel, be placed under a conservation restriction and may be deeded to a third party to hold the conservation parcel as open space. The town has expressed significant concern regarding the existing condition of the proposed conservation parcel which will require extensive environmental testing and cleanup relating to years of illegal dumping and habitation. Through ter the terms of a proposed memorandum of understanding, MOU, with the town of Arlington, the applicant intends to establish a proposed funding schedule to advance certain conservation and or restoration efforts for the conservation parcel. Um, and then goes on. Um, as to what has been discussed as being in the MOU. So that um, everybody knows that the applicant and the town are negotiating a memorandum of understanding in regards to the final disposition of um, the remaining portion of the site that's not uh, being considered for development. And that, M that memorandum of understanding, they're still under negotiation. It has not been signed. It has not been uh, released as of yet. So uh, the board is putting in findings based and um, conditions based on our understanding of what the, uh, the memorandum of understanding uh, should include. Um, but the conditions are actually gonna be conditional um, on the, uh, on the, that if the town does sign a, a memorandum of understanding with the applicant, that that will supersede uh, the terms of the comprehensive uh, permit in those regards. So there's the perpetual restriction against future development of the conservation parcel. Um, that, so the applicant has already contracted a third party services to engage in the removal of uh, solid waste needles, sharps previously disposed on the property. Um, and they have put forward $100,000 uh, towards the effort um, working with Somerville Homeless Coalition, the Arlington Police Department. They were Finding the community issue, finding housing for unhoused persons on the property. Um, the applicant recognizes additional funds will be required to perform environmental testing, remove additional solid waste debris, and prepare and implement a prioritized mitigation plan. Um, and so for that, they had proposed uh, an additional $100,000. And then the applicant is offered to fund over the course of a 10-year period, an annual contribution of $25,000 for continued implementation and maintenance of the conservation parcel, provide assurance to the ZBA, the applicant is offered to accept a condition to include a $25,000 annual maintenance budget for 10 years upon the issuance of a final certificate of occupancy. Um, so the, these, and then the findings do not limit the applicant's obligation to clean, restore, or remediate the site, nor does it remove any other requirements on the applicant under state or federal law. So basically what this is, this is what has come up on the course of our hearings as to what the applicant has offered um, in regards to uh, what's referred to as the conservation parcel. Are there any questions or comments Mr. about that? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. The thing that, that a lot of people are concerned about that isn't really addressed here is who's going to own the parcel at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, 
some of how important that is depends a lot on <clears throat> what the conservation restrict how the cons conservation restriction would work. Um, certainly, if the conservation restriction were essentially granted uh, to the town, the town would enforce it, uh, and that would give that would put the town in a good position to make sure that, uh, that things develop in the way that they ought to. And to some extent, the same thing is true of granting it to a third party, so long as the third party is an appropriately selected entity. What I'm concerned about is what exactly a conservation restriction means if the applicant is basically giving it to itself. Um, who's going to enforce that? Uh, what actually is it going to mean? And procedurally, how does it even happen? Um, and I was wondering if maybe Mr. Aberdy could, uh, uh, could enlighten us on, on that, because this is one of those things that if it may be a contentious thing in the negotiations between the town and the applicant, and we did explore it to some extent in the hearings. And the level of trust is better now than it was five years ago, but it's still not great. And a lot of people in the town, I think, are, are worried that a memorandum of understanding that resolves this issue won't be forthcoming and that the town won't have the protections uh, that it is envisioning uh, in the management of the uh, conservation parcel. What exactly clarification are you looking for? So what happens when, uh, let's suppose that there is no third party and that the town does not receive, the, is, the, is not granted the rights. I'm assuming that this conservation restriction is a, is a granted thing so that somebody other than the applicant normally has the ability to enforce it. What happens when neither of that occurs and the applicant proposes to continue to own the property but subject to a conservation restriction which it voluntarily enters into? Well, if it enters into a conservation restriction, then there is going to be a third party that actually holds that conservation restriction. So they won't have full control over the remaining parcel, you know, irrespective of whether or not um, they, you know, they retain deeded title to it. It'll still be the, the party that holds the restriction that actually gets to say what does or does not go on on that parcel. I'm not sure, you know, where the concern would be. Here. Is it true that the, uh, I had understood at least from the closing hearing when this thing came up that the applicant was proposing to, re you know, I guess it was to retain ownership in the parcel. It wasn't clear to me that they were planning to grant the conservation easement to anyone else. And one of the reasons they thought it was very useful to them to retain control over what's done on the property is that they had some thought of rendering a, a sort of a park-like atmosphere that would be a, an amenity to the um, to the apartment building. I'm really testing how that would work if that's what they want to do, if that's where their interest is. How do these legal arrangements deal with that? Well, if, again, if, if it's subject to a conservation restriction, you know that's a legal process that's done through the state. Um, it has to be signed off by the state, and there has to be a third party nonprofit entity that actually I see okay election. so and I, mean, I don't see any reason for concern you know as long as it's going to be a actual um, conservation restriction as, as set forth under the statute right I thank you mr Hebert. I I was led astray a little bit by the tenor of the discussion in the hearing which which seemed to eliminate the the interfacing of the third party, but uh, I'm happy that that the situation is as you described. Yeah, it it, it can't. It's not eligible to be a, a deed restricted conservation restriction that's enforceable in perpetuity unless there is that third party nonprofit entity, um, which, which can be the conservation commission or it can be, you know, a, a separate nonprofit conservation group. But it does have to be something that's accepted by the state. It can't just be the applicant as the party that's holding the restriction on its own property. Right. Thank you. You're welcome.
Thank you. Um, so in, in the sort of in the line with uh, Mr. Hanlon with the, the sort of the start of your kind um, your comments, initially the applicant had indicated they were interested in donating the land to the town. And that has certainly shifted over the course of the last five years to being um, much more that that land might transfer to a third party or that the applicant may hold the property um, with it, as Mr. Haverty said, a, a conservation easement that's a conservation restriction that's held by um, another party. Do we want to include an additional paragraph that sort of documents that um, the evolution of the, the ownership on the conservation parcel? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I think that we sort of do for many, many of us on mm -hmm. the board and off. Uh, that evolution is not a neutral thing and it's part of the factual background of this case. Do you think it should be part of 99 or should we make it a different number? Because the subs are all things that the applicant has stated. Um, I mean, we could do it as a, another one, because I mean, it does sort of relate to what the applicant has stated, but it doesn't relate specifically to the, right. it, what's it, in the MOU. It may be, I, I don't feel strongly about this, but it might be useful to bring it to, to bring it at, at the very end. Mm -hmm. um, I hate to introduce a new paragraph without getting rid of one. Good. If I just accept this as it is. Get a, so, okay, so we can start a paragraph here. It would still be under 99, but it would be a separate sort of follow-up paragraph. I'm just typing away here, so feel free to jump in if you have recommendations. You're doing good. I'm just thankful in the back of my mind to my high school typing teacher, whose name I wish I could recall, so I could <laughs> thank her at this moment in time.
How's that? Chairman, that looks pretty good to me. I think that, it, Mr. Chairman, if I may, it, it's, yes, it's important that I think you've succeeded in doing this in saying that it's that having somebody to hold the conservation agreement is of the utmost performance. It avoids the potential danger of signaling to the applicant that, well, that would be all right then. Um, I think that it, it's always true that having somebody, that dealing with a counterparty in, in whom you have a great deal of faith and a history of, of cooperation and, and uh, uh, good dealing is, is always better than having a provision in an agreement. And uh, so at least from my point of view, um, I would very much hope that the town and the applicant are pursuing this with an open mind towards having either the town or a third party, but not the applicant retain ownership of uh, the conservation parcel, notwithstanding the, the uh, conservation restriction. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Anything further from the board on this one? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So it's not necessarily specific to that paragraph, which I like a lot, but it's really just a clarification and perhaps from Mr. Haverty. So in terms of the terms of a conservation restriction, are those essentially something that we are going to develop or have set out in the conditions, or is it something that's more pro forma? I just want to know how much input we have or if we need to have in, in terms of what those particulars might be? So there is sort of a, a standard format, you know, that the state uses for conservation restrictions, but there can be, you know, a, a decent amount of variation within those. I, I mean, I don't know that you want to get into that sort of finite detail as to what exactly you want to see. I think that you want the opportunity to review the conservation restriction before it's executed. Okay. Thanks. I think that that should be sufficient. Good. Okay. So that brings us to number 100, the general section. Um, and these are fairly boilerplate, I believe. Um, I think there's anything here we needed to review. I guess so, Paul. Uh, Mr. Haberty, at the last meeting we had edited this paragraph, the first paragraph of paragraph 100, to add the sentence that no time during the public hearing did the applicant contend that the cost of the project rendered it uneconomic, as such the board finds that such conditions will not render the project uneconomic. Um, to the extent that such conditions may render the project uneconomic, and then the rest of that I think is, a, is specifically um, from the prior case. Does, do you see any issue with that statement? I mean, the only problem with that statement is the applicant never got to see the final terms of the decision during mm -hmm. public hearing, so never really had the chance to say whether or not it believed the project rendered the, you know, the decision rendered the project uneconomic. I mean, the basic outlines were there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the conditions that were discussed, you know, pretty much in great detail while the hearing was still open, you know, are the main conditions impacting the, the economic viability of the decision. So I do think in spirit that this probably is accurate. Okay. Thank you. And that's the end of the findings. Is there anything that we missed in the findings that we want to make sure we go back and add? Nothing. I'll go ahead and save this. 
you know, move us into the conditions, which we've spent considerable time on already. Um, this is the, the plans that are forming a part of what's referred to as the approved plans, as Mr. Hanlon had pointed out. Section B is the section on affordability. And again, as we had done on the prior case, the town does not have, we're not requesting any uh, local preference in who may apply for the units. Any submission requirements. Indeed. Uh, there was a request. Um, so the landscape plan for the area is not under the jurisdiction of the wetlands bylaw. Um, so the originally it had said all planting shall consist of native non-invasive drought tolerant species. Um, and so there was a, a request by Mr. Mills to add uh, non-cultivar to that. Um, so just be clear, so this is for the plantings that are around the, the buildings themselves and not for the areas that are farther, uh, that are a part of the conservation land or and are not in the wetlands areas. So I just wanted to make sure that that was something we had wanted to impose um, for those areas. People okay with that? All right. And then section subsection E. So this is the this is the landscape plan for the areas that are um, in the wetlands areas and under the that are typically under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. Um, there was a this the rational versus rationale question. So we were uh, working that out with Mr. Handlin this afternoon. Uh, so number one, the quantity of plants before and after reed vegetation and the rationale behind the removal and maintenance plan. And um, under the planting plan, the, the total area in SF, just saying the total area in square feet, just to clarify what we're what is being requested. And again, rational versus rationale. Application plans. Uh, the survival rate of the plantings is less than 80%. The dead failing or disease plantings will be replaced. Two. No idea what that's asking for. Hmm. The, rest of the conditions, uh, the C2s are prior to the issuance of any building permits. Um, and Mr. Henley pointed out the applicant will be responsible for all applicable sewer permit capacity impacts and privilege fees as applicable, notwithstanding the foregoing the applicant shall not be responsible for any infiltration and inflow INI fees. So it's, they do precede, not go after. So that should be foregoing rather than following. Uh, and then again, I think this is probably the same as well. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. So in H, I just see that we have the word applicable twice and I'm okay with it if there's a reason for it to be there, but where it says shall be responsible for applicable, do we just want to say oh. all sewer permit as applicable, leave it, leave as applicable? Either way. <laughs> I just didn't think we needed applicable twice. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, one, sir. Um, 
perhaps consider sewer permit to sewer sewer permits, um, just because everything else in that, um, you know, in that uh, conjunction okay. is par plural. <laughs> okay, so the applicant will be responsible for all applicable sewer permits, capacity impacts, and privilege fees. For Oxford. Uh, notwithstanding the foregoing, the applicant shall not be responsible for any INI fees. The applicant will be responsible for all applicable water and sewer system fees as per officially promulgated fee schedules and uniformly applicable to all other town of Arlington projects. Notwithstanding the foregoing, the applicant shall not be responsible for any INIs. Okay. Commissioner Chairman. Yes, sir. In H, um, I think the intention here when you get to capacity mm -hmm. is that you're everything else in that list is a fee of some sort. And I think maybe the idea was that should be capacity impact fees. Oh, okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yep. Sewer permits, capacity impacts and privilege fees. So then, so that actually this, I'm assuming there is such a thing as a cap capacity impact fee, although I'm not aware that I've had it. APCO would be responsible for all applicable sewer permits oops, and capacity impact. Let me, Chairman, let me just try again. H is all about fees that the applicant has to pay. Mm -hmm. And I think the intent oh, I see what you're saying. was yep. that if there's a permit fee, they have to pay that, a capacity fee, they have to pay that. And privilege, well, I'm not quite sure what the privilege fee is. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how that works out. But I think the, the theme that goes all the way through it is fees, which ones do they have to pay and which ones don't they? So well, let's see what this looks like. So the applicant will be responsible for all applicable sewer permit, comma, capacity impact, comma, and privilege fees. Does that sound right? I think so. I mean, it sounds right. I, the question is whether it makes sense in the real world, because I'm not really up on the, the various fees that people pay. And I'm, maybe one of the rest of us, Aaron or, or Kevin, uh, might be able to help. I think I agree with you. I think it does read, it read, definitely reads better in this format and is probably more accurate. And just as I, I do note that it does, we do have the word all or the phrase all applicable. Mm -hmm. So if one of these is not in fact a, a fee, it's probably, it may be okay simply because it doesn't apply. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. All right. Moving on. <clears throat> okay. uh, so, this is what is we said. So, so the first of in the absence of a signed memorandum of understanding. Uh, and the second. Uh, project design and construction. Project commencement of any work on the property. Inspections, temporary signage. Uh, Twenty-two. Uh, so this was about the that the applicant shall comply with includes the noise abatement bylaw. So we just want thought we should add, except it's specifically waived in this decision because we do waive a portion of it in order to allow changing the work hours. And D33. So D33 was again was the is the the second half of the construction staging.
Um, Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. this is just a, a curious question. Um, you know, the, the phrase not closer than two miles. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious why two as opposed to say one or three. It was arbitrary. It was uh, far enough away from the site to, to keep it off of the, the major roads. But uh, the one wording we could add is two miles or approved by AHJ, you know, the authority having jurisdiction or other approved uh, or other approved by the AHJ. <laughs> and the 15 minutes is also arbitrary. I think it's, I mean, I think these, these numbers are trying to just highlight um, that uh, highlight a distance that they, they can't just park around the block on somebody else's clogging somebody else's small street mm -hmm. or they can't you know sit there for 30 minutes or an hour you know so okay thank you thank you for clarifying that Jim? yes sir um, as I recall, the applicant, when they were describing where the module, the staging area would be, was actually further away than mm -hmm. two miles. Um, but I'm not sure that I see the interest that we have once it's out of the neighborhood. In other words, this is about protecting the neighborhood from what otherwise would be staging there. If it was two miles, three miles, five miles, or a mile and a half, it's it's probably not our problem. Or if it is, it's certainly a different problem because that mile and a half is on some of the street and some other part of Arlington. Um, and so I'm wondering whether we need to be as specific. The important thing is that it uh, that the unloading will take place, you know, on the property itself. Now, when we get to idling, we're introducing not just the question of pollution in the neighborhood, which is not insignificant, uh, but you're also introducing uh, a general pollution question that also has implications for greenhouse gases. And I'm not quite sure I understand why idling is necessary at all. I mean, you know, lots of people turn their cars off when they're waiting to do something. And it seems to me that that would be a better practice than sitting there and letting it idle. I realize that there is some stories and presumably evidence that, you know, you, you emit a larger amount of uh, gases of various kinds when you're starting your car. Uh, and that may affect, you know, some length of time thing. But I'd sort of like to see them not idling their vehicles in the neighborhood at all. I think I, I probably would just take out the idling of construction vehicles. I, I think I got my own wording confused about being idle and then idling. So. I don't. I don't know that I was trying to necessarily um, speak to the to a car, a vehicle being on or off. I mean, I agree. I don't think they should idle at all. But I mean, the reality is that's just what they do. Have a have a vehicle idling. The only comment, Mr. Hanlon, about the distance is, I, I, I guess my concern was if you didn't give a value, then it would just leave it open to trusting that they would do it far enough away. And if that's the case, what's the point of writing any of this? So I felt like, you know, what what, you off, what one often sees or I see on large projects is that you get con concrete trucks lined up around the block, whether it's two blocks away or four blocks away. And, or you get, you know, you get modular trucks lined up, you know, 
wherever they can park and wait. And so they can just kind of fall into the queue. So that, that was the only intent of having a, a number totally arbitrary, but I think it was really just to get it out of the neighborhood. But yeah, along the way, I, I see what the, the point is, is that it's not on the street if it's out around the block. Well, that would be fine. I wouldn't be unduly restrictive about it though. I mean, two miles away is far enough. I mean, you know, there's gonna be a lot of finding things. And it seems to me that if we're going to impose a restriction, there needs to be a substantial local concern behind the restriction, which you've just articulated, and that sounds fine to me. But I wouldn't go further than that in being over prescriptive. So what I have here um, is a construction staging specifically for the modular units, but applicable to all other aspects of construction, such as concrete trucks, shall occur offsite in a location acceptable to the director of inspectional services. Yeah. All deliveries to the site shall be offloaded on the property. Delivery vehicles shall not be permitted to idle. Delivery and construction vehicles shall not block any driveways or public ways. The intent of this condition is to prevent traffic congestion and the idling of construction vehicles. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So where you said driveways or public ways, I don't know um, if all of the streets in that vicinity are public ways or if there might be a private way tucked in there. And I, I don't know if we would be overstepping our bounds, but I'd like to see private or public ways. We can certainly have private ways. The intent of this condition is to prevent traffic congestion and reduce the impact of construction vehicles on the local neighborhood. Mr. Chairman, do we have somewhere a provision that relates to parking construction vehicles on the street? I seem to remember that we have something like that somewhere. I believe we do. Something. Parking of all vehicles and equipment must be on the property during construction. There it is under D16. <coughs> Any further adjustment to this paragraph? Lock that down. Chairman? Yes, sir. I, I just want to, I just had this thought that popped in and it's just that, um, you know, as uh, Mr. Ford had, you know, talked about queuing and I'm wondering, is the language, do you think that we have acceptable to director, director of inspection and services? So is that sufficient? And I'm hoping it is so that if somebody a mile away says, you know, there are a number of concrete trucks parked on our street mm -hmm. and, you know, they've been there every day for the last three, four days and they are attached to this project. And so do we think that that with the language of this paragraph would give um, inspectional services the authority to say you can't do that? I guess that's my main concern. Mm. Mr. Haverty, what's your sense on that? My sense is that if it constitutes a zoning issue in another district, then the Director of Inspectional Services has whatever authority it has to enforce the zoning on that property. Mm -hmm. Waiver of any zoning provisions for anything that's off of the, um, the 40B site. So whatever they do has to comply with existing zoning in terms of that staging. And I'm assuming if the 
vehicles were being staged on the public way that was caught in a manner that was causing a problem, then obviously they'd be under the jurisdiction of the police department to, to address such issues. Yep. Okay, so I believe that's the last of the Ds. E, construction completion, certificate of occupancy. Um, again, this is more of the, in the absence of a signed memorandum of understandings. Um, so this is the one where uh, put in a conservation restriction shall be in effect in perpetuity and shall limit the use of said parcel for conservation of the wetland resources and passive recreation by the general public. When we were talking about the conservation restriction earlier, um, there was something we wanted to make sure we included in this place. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So we actually are, we, we, we've got a great paragraph that I think was written by Mr. DuPont earlier about wildlife. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the conservation of wetland resources is sort of part of that, but it's not the whole of it. And so we might want to think a little more deeply in what it is that, um, what limitations should be. Uh, you know, on the other hand, these things I gather from what Mr. Haverty says are generally fairly cut and dried and everybody knows what they mean if you follow the forms. And if you get too original, you may not know what they mean. So I'm a little bit nervous about doing too much, but the truth is, is that we're eager to protect more than just what's here. And I don't know whether getting into more detail would be advantageous, uh, whether this language would exclude anything we wanted to include, or whether trying to wrestle with the question is just going to make it more more difficult. Because you know we don't have any direct authority as far as I know over what's in this conservation resource, conservation restriction anyway. So earlier we had the earlier we had uh, thought about whether the conservation the final conservation restriction whether it should be whether the board should review it. Did we want to include that? Mr. Haverty seems to be wisely nodding his head. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you should include that as a provision. Be submitted to the board for approval or just for review? For administrative review. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I think I might suggest changing in the first line the status of the memorandum of understanding to um, the status of a memorandum. Okay. B sounds a little bit more definitive as if it already exists to me. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, if I could follow up a wise comment with an almost silly one, but we might want to just say CR because we made a big effort in the preceding paragraph to introduce, to introduce that abbreviation and set it there. And it would be yeah, nice to stick with it. 
What was that, Mr. Haveny? I, I think what Mr. Hanlon is saying is use the term CR rather than conservation restriction. Yeah. <laughs> and per Mr. Hanlon's earlier comment, do we want to include anything about what we would want the conservation restriction to include, or should we just leave that to the negotiation? I know in our prior discussions with the Conservation Commission, um, you know, we had talked about preserve, you know, the the, uh, the you know the passive recreation. They were very important. They were very concerned that um, you know con conservation of the wetland resources was the first and foremost, the most important aspect of the conservation restriction, and that absolutely needs to be first. Um, and that passive recreation would be sort of a secondary thing. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I mean, I guess. I think this is kind of complicated. I, the underlying idea is that is that this land should remain in a more or less wild state. Mm -hmm. So turning it into something that looks like Central Park would probably not be what it is that you're looking to do with the CR, even mm -hmm. though that's really great for passive recreation and may uh, preserve some wetland resources and, and, and other things. And as I recall, there was some discussion in the last or the second to the last day of our hearings of just exactly what it is that would be envisioned here. And the kind of passive recreation that I think it was the Conservation Commission, but somebody had in mind was something like a boardwalk, which is already there near the, there is one similar to that, uh, taking you through the wetlands and near the transit station. Um, but you know, turning it into something that's unduly prettied up is sort of not what we want to do. Right. Uh, and it's hard to it's kind of, uh, it's hard to get, get it said exactly right. Uh, Mr. Haverty, I wonder how is it that, I mean, this is a, something that everybody will have to struggle, struggle with because it's very hard to say exactly what you mean in this kind of situation, how do others do it? Again, generally, it's it's left to be resolved after the permit has been issued, but through a review by the board of the actual um, conservation restriction to be executed. So, I mean, so that's my recommendation: is the board re reserve the right to review the conservation restriction that's proposed to be executed. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's going to be executed between the applicant, the state, and whatever the entity is that's going to sort of oversee. So, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if the best way to, 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 to do this is to say less and simply say that the CR shall be in effect in perpetuity and shall limit the use of said parcel uh, to conservation purposes and to a lesser extent limited passive rec recreation by the general public. And you just don't, th that prepositional phrase of the wetland resources is where we're getting into trouble because that's both a little bit too broad and a little bit and not quite broad enough. And it seems to me that if you just get rid of it, uh, you've got something that, w that says enough about what the standard is that we know what we're doing when it comes back to us. Uh, and and uh, but it doesn't unnarrow it doesn't un, un, undesirably narrow things down. So you would get rid of of the wetland resources. Yeah. And I would just say to conservation purposes. limit the use of the parcel to conservation purposes and to a lesser extent limited passive recreation by the general public. That would be fine. Yes, that Mr. Would... Chair. Mr. Revelak. Yeah, I was going to say this, I mean, it sounds like, I get the sense that, you know, we, we're going to at least have the opportunity to review this, but 
Um, we may not necessarily be the 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 body that negotiates the MOU, and we sure. might not necessarily be party to it. Um, but I, I think we have done a, the finding section. I, I think does a pretty thorough job in um, you know outlining the various ways in which the conservation parcel is important, and you know hopefully um, some of that you know rubs off down the road, so to speak. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Revelak. So with that in mind, does this sentence provide the guidance that we're looking to provide? All right, everyone. Yes. Okay. And then and G as well. Just basically yes. grants us the ability to. Oops, no good. That's where we were. Okay. Um, whoops, now we have two G's, so I have to change that to H. And then E2. It's prior to the issuance of the final certificate of occupancy, documentation. E three is property management plan, and then E four. So we this was we had included the finding in regards to um, monitoring the, the local traffic. That was uh, something that had been recommended by TAC, um, and so this is the condition that would uh, correspond to that. Um, so this is new as well. Let's see if I can shrink it so it actually all appears at once. So close. Uh, so within three years after the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall participate in a post-development monitoring study designed to determine the local traffic on neighborhood streets and to make recommendations regarding traffic calming measures that may be necessary and desirable to mitigate impacts on the streets on and between Lake Street and the project location, which include Lake Street, Wilson Avenue, Little John Street, Homestead Road, Birch Street, Margaret Street, Mary Street, Mott Street, and Dorothy Road, and Parker Street. I'm just going to change that to street. Um, the study shall be submitted to the Town of Arlington Transportation Advisory Committee for review and approval by TAC and the Arlington Select Board in accordance with the procedure set forth in the Town of Arlington Transportation Advisory Committee Traffic Calming Guidelines approved by TAC December 8, 2010, Traffic Calming Guidelines. The applicant shall cooperate with the town in implementing all such measures. So, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, so this obviously is not one of the most muscular conditions that we have to impose. Um, and it would have been nicer to be able to do more, but all of this is going to happen substantially after this project is built. It's kind of a looking backwards. And I think that it's appropriate to, uh, to me at least, the main purpose of it is, is not so much to try to force the applicant to do a study and to push through traffic calming measures. I think that, that we might not be on firm ground attempting to do that. But it is important to have someone say, look, there's a problem here. TAC said there was a problem here. And TAC actually will be the agency that is going to review what, what the study would say. So somebody needs to do it. Most of the changes that have to take place will be changes that are within the power of the town to do. And ultimately we have to depend upon the, count, the town to cooperate with the applicant in doing something that will meet the needs of, of, of the people in the neighborhood as best they can be met. Um, and so I'm sort of satisfied with not reaching too far um, because I have a, some hope that a process will emerge from this where it's not just the applicant, but also the town and everybody is paying attention to a problem, which I think we all think is, is significant. Well, thank you for that. Mr. Chair. Mr. Mills. 
Could we go back up a little bit? I thought I saw one section where you just had an A and not a B. I think for formatting, if you're going to have an A, you have to have a B. Yeah, E2 there. Do you need to have a B if you have an A? Um, I think there was a B at one point and then it got deleted. Well, actually, I think uh, E2B became B E3 if I oh, you remember right. correctly. So you could just have that run into as one sentence then, or one paragraph. Just a simple, for, I mean, a, a silly formatting thing. I don't know whether we want to pay attention to it or not. If I can get, I'll tell you, if I can get Word to accept it. It's tough when you get that indentation. <laughs> All right, that works. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything further on E4? This is F. Do an F, nothing new in G. There's anything new in H. Big change in I was I went through and got rid of all the blanks and then went back and made sure that we had all the references correct. Chase. Back to the decision vote. Um, it was noted that <sighs> this is a town hall Groveland, so we've changed that to Arlington. Um, that's a set decision on waivers. So I think the only one that we've, that there's one that has changed. Um, we'll make sure there wasn't anything else sort of hanging out. So it's 32. So this is the one in regards to noise abatement and the set, resetting the hours. So we had originally had a condition in here that just said the applicant you know, requests a waiver to allow for hours of construction that differ and then the waiver would be granted this condition and the question that was brought up was that if for some reason the um the applicant had wanted to get sunday hours back and had appealed to the state for that but still wanted to keep the early morning hours um and so basically what this does is it states that should one part of the condition be way, be disallowed, then the whole condition is disallowed. Very good. So sort of maintains it as an all or nothing. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just a typo after Sunday it says AN, you need a D. Whereabouts is that? Sorry. Right after the word Sundays. Oh. Under board action. Sundays or legal holidays. Oh, 
There we go. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, in one place we use the clause Sundays or legal holidays, and one place we use Sundays and legal holidays. I, I think we want and um, rather than, I think we, I, I, I suggest and in both places. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I'd be willing to vote for or. And the reason is that at least from the point of view of language, uh, the last thing, if the pro, if you say and Sundays and legal holidays, suppose what happened was the prohibition against work on Sundays was invalidated for some reason, but legal holidays was left in play. And really, what we want to say is, if, if either the Sundays or the legal holidays um, are eliminated, then the whole thing is eliminated. That that's kind of where I would be. Now, maybe you might, maybe you all uh, <clears throat> have a different idea of what the policy should be, but the reason for choosing war rather than and is exactly that. What happens if Sunday or, or holidays is preserved, but the other isn't? I withdraw my suggestion. <laughs> what if we say and or? <laughs> Go back and or? That'd be okay. As long as there's an or in there somewhere, it makes it clear. So the waiver to allow hours of operation beginning at 7.30 a.m. on weekdays is contingent on the limitation prohibiting work on Sundays or legal holidays contained in D16. If the prohibition against work on Sundays or legal holidays is subsequently stricken from this decision, this waiver shall cease to be operative. Right. Does that sound good to all? All right, no more comments or track changes. Okay, we have gone through the entire draft decision, it reached its end, which means last Request of all if there are any final findings or conditions that any member of the board would want to attach to this document. No from all. I see a no from all. So that brings us up to having to make a decision here. Um, so what the board has in front of us, so we now have a draft decision that um, we have effectively gone through and called everything we wanted to change, everything we wanted to modify so that it is as uh, complete as the, as the board um, has made it. And so the board still has in front of it um, sort of the three options the board had in front of it when we started on this process. Um, the board has the option of approving the original application without uh, condition, which I, I, I think it's fair to say that the board is not considering. Um, the board has the option of voting to approve the, this decision, which has conditions and waivers in it, um, or the board can vote to um, to deny the permit. Uh, those three options are those options are still in front of the board, um, and it is you know not up to me to direct the board how it you know how it should want to proceed how. It's really, it needs to be up to the individual members. Um, really what the board is trying to determine is, does this decision, um, does it meet local needs for this project um, in terms of you know, providing affordable housing, which 
is the, the purpose of the comprehensive uh, permit process, but also in regards to other um, needs of the local community in terms of you know the, the traffic, the enjoyment of their neighborhood, the wetlands, the wildlife, um, and, and all other aspects that we have spent time um, discussing on this project. So at this point, um, are there any topics that the members of the board would want to discuss in regards to um, how we would proceed on a on a vote or anything that you know pertains to the project that they would want us to discuss? Are people pretty much ready to cast a vote? Hey, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, we really can go two ways here. We could try if anyone was interested in making a motion to deny, we could discuss that and decide whether or not we wanted to do that. Um, or we can, uh, I think, have a motion that would move the adoption of the decision that we've been working on for the last month. Um, at that point, the discussion, if people were so inclined, uh, if that failed to get the requisite majority, then it would be denied. Uh, so uh, in view of the lateness of the hour, I would sort of like to skip to part two rather than have a preliminary motion so that e either the motion carries to take a, to approve the draft decision uh, or it doesn't, in which case we reject the draft decision. But either way, in a shorter period of time, with only one discussion, we'd be able to resolve the entire case. I think that very much makes sense. Um, so Mr. Chairman, if, if people are comfortable going that way, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to start it by moving the acceptance of the decision uh, as we have perfected it in a technical legal sense uh, over the course of the last month. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Is there discussion in regards to the motion? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> I think with all the people watching, it, it, it would be so anticlimactic if we didn't have any discussion. <laughs> um, but I think everybody would value a short one. Um, this is by far, I mean, obviously it's not perfect. Um, before I was on the board, I was still seeing all the signs about preserve the Mugar wetlands. And the applicant has worked with the Conservation Commission to go as, about as far as the Conservation Commission could get them to go to protect the Westlands and then a little bit further. Um, now, is that going to be enough given all of the things we know are likely to happen to us over you know, the lifetime of my grandchildren? No. Uh, and I wish we could do, I wish we could have done more. I wish we could have focused in on what more there is to do and actually followed a little more the advice of the Weston Memorandum and the Arlington Land Trust. Um, but we haven't been given the right to be the czar of this project. All we can do is operate within a matrix of legal rules. And so the first thing I observe is that um, we have gone a long way towards protecting the Mugar wetlands. Uh, and all of that, as Mr. Moore pointed out uh, at near the last hearing, all of that is at issue. It's not like we get to bank at all. Who knows what would happen if this goes to the state and if the HAC gets its hand to, to it. They aren't looking at the same thing we do. They don't know about the, the wetlands. They, you know, it's all abstract to them. And for them, with all due respect to everybody here, you know, we understand that what's at stake is the quality of life in this neighborhood. But for them, it'll be, oh, that's the Arlington NIMBY case. And I don't like it, but you know that's what they're going to do. And so 
I think that we've got a lot of good things in what has happened so far. Um, it, I would have liked to have more, but I we think we've got a lot. And I think we're much better off preserving the advantages that we've gotten uh, and, uh, and adopting something which I trust at least the applicant uh, won't appeal. And if, and if the applicant does appeal, then fine, that, that would be the same as our turning it down. So I would like to do that. I do think that I would like to say that the hearing has sensitized me to the pressure this, this neighborhood is suffering under um, a lot, both in terms of the flooding and which I think has got to, to some extent be due to uh, inadequate stormwater management on the town's part, but I'm not ready to find that because I don't know enough about it. Um, but the, this, this, this neighborhood is under a lot of pressure. And it seems to me that we have done what we can to address that. And we don't have the ability to do everything that we might do. And at the same time, affordable housing is an overwhelming need in this town and throughout the, and, and throughout the Boston region. So it's a hard decision, I think. And I certainly become acquainted with the people who've been talking to us. I'm going to miss them sometimes. Uh, and, and maybe not some others, but I, I think that, that all of these cases show us aspects of life in Arlington that we don't often see, that we're not really looking. And, uh, and I think that, that I'm hoping that not just with respect to this project, but generally with respect to what happens in the neighborhood, that this is at least the beginning for some things that measures that can be done by other people uh, that would relieve some of the pressure uh, that, that people properly feel. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. Uh, I would just like to say that I think um, as a board, we've done as best possible given the circumstances to make a, a so purse out of a sow's ear, so to say. I think it's a bit of pill this neighborhood's gonna have to swallow, but I believe moving forward affirmatively on this is the best result the neighborhood can hope for because we've got our conditions in place on many issues and the, uh, the power the applicant has behind them with the state, if we voted in the negative, I think would be even worse on the neighbors and they certainly have my personal sympathy. That being said, I think, you know, I think we need to vote in the affirmative, both for the affordable housing and B, to control things as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Are there others? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So I, I would like to agree with both uh, Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Mills. I think it was stated very clearly and eloquently. And I think the thing that I've personally wrestled with is the thought in the back of my mind that I just wish that there was something to do to stop this or to just sort of cut it down substantially. But I think as Mr. Mills just indicated, we really don't have that authority because the state is the ultimate arbiter of this. And so I think it's uh, a reluctant decision on my part, but I have to be in agreement with both uh, Mr. Mills and Mr. Hanlon uh, with regard to the analysis that they gave. Mr. Revlak? I just wanted to, um, trying not to repeat earlier comments. Um, this is this has been a very long negotiating process. Um, and, you know, considering where we started, I there are a few elements of the project that we managed to negotiate that I, I, th I feel personally proud of. Um, I understand, as Mr. Bill said, this will be a, likely be a difficult pill for the neighborhood to swallow. 
but I'm hoping that um, you know some good things will come of it. And I'm I'm also hoping that Mr. Rearig is right in that in 50 years the thing that will you know be making the most difference and that will people will remember the most is the conservation parcel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowland. Mr. O'Rourke and Mr. Ford, did either of you have comments you had wanted to make? Chairman, I guess I would just reiterate, reiterate what others have said. I mean, this project was pre-approved by this, was approved by the state with you know, over what, 207 uh, apartments and the 12 units. And I think it bears repeating again that if we rejected this outright, people have to know the applicant could appeal and go back to what they originally wanted. And then secondly, if we make our conditions too onerous, um, the applicant can appeal and go back to what they originally wanted. So I, I do think it's a, a reluctant decision in a lot of ways, or, or it's a reluctant decision, but I think we have to try and come up with something that balances um, the need for local housing with the town interests. And I think a lot of people uh, have done a lot of work to get us there. So. Um, and, uh, and I think, um, I, I'm inclined to vote in favor of it, even though it is a bitter pill to uh, swallow for the neighbors, because I think it would be a lot worse if we deny, or if the conditions are a lot more onerous, such as what Mr. Dupont said, if we tried to reduce this significantly, I think that would be a real problem. And then the neighbors would be back to 200 plus units with the 12 townhouses in front. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rourke. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't really have anything to add other than to just say I agree with my peers. I'm, I'm not happy about this project on this site. I don't think it's a good thing for the site, but I think um, our options um, are, are a little bit limited. So, I, um, so yeah. I'll just leave it at agreeing with my, my peers here. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Yeah, so... I mean, really, I feel you know very strongly in line with uh, with the other members of my board. I mean, the the comprehensive permit process was initiated by the state to generate additional um, affordable housing, which was a problem uh, for the state at the time it was passed, and continues to be a problem for the state. And um, you know, Arlington is a town with limited available land for projects uh, such as this. I think this is probably the largest undeveloped parcel left in Arlington. Um, and as initially envisioned back in the 50s, the plan was for this to, to be a shopping plaza um, available from Route 2. And that did not come to fruition. That was attempted again in the 70s and didn't come to fruition. And the town has tried to purchase this property outright for uh, conservation and that has been unsuccessful as well. And so this is, um, in some ways, it's the most recent in a string of uh, attempts to develop this parcel, but is likely to be the final one um, because the this process doesn't allow um, for a town to easily bypass um, its responsibility to provide affordable housing to those members of its population that are in need of housing. And the sort of the carrot that the only carrot that this really comes with, I think in all well, two carrots, this comes with in a lot of ways. One is um, that this does allow finally for sort of a final disposition of the wetland portion of the property for the conservation parcel to have it be properly cleaned, to have it be restored uh, to have the invasives managed on it, to have it be planted um, with native species and to have it be brought back um, and to serve as a much better uh, functioning wetland resource, but also as a place for wildlife and, you know, hopefully a place where there can be some uh, you know, limited uh, enjoyment by the public. So the public can come out and, and see what this parcel really is and to do it in a, in a safe manner and in a way that allows them to really enjoy the, the neighborhood. Um, and the other piece of this is that, you know, 
uh, understanding that this is sort of an imposition on the neighborhood and that you know, I think everyone would be more than happy to have uh, the six duplex units on Dorothy Road and nothing else, um, that there will be new neighbors in this neighborhood. Um, and that you know, we're very hopeful that those neighbors will become an integral part of this, this neighborhood and share the passion that the current residents do for this neighborhood and that they will you know, be, as, be, as, be as passionate and be as supportive and um, really take a strong effort to be a part of this, this neighborhood. Because as, as we have been learning over the course of the, you know, the last 20 months or so, this is really a special place in, in Arlington which has you know, really strong support um, among its residents. And you know, while there are uh, certain people we have met through this process who we have heard from you know, time and time again, there are lots of people we may have heard from once and certainly many, many more who we have received uh, emails from and correspondence from, but have not uh, spoken up directly in the meetings. And uh, one of my primary goals being chair of this board has been to make sure that we listen to everybody um, and that everyone is heard by this board and that everyone feels that they've been heard by this board. And we understand that you know, it's not possible for us to, to necessarily implement everything that everybody wants and to do things the way that everybody wants because there are so many um, competing interests and competing needs um, in regards to this area and the, the issues of affordable housing um, in, this, in this town. But when this started, we had two main problems. One was uh, the problem of how to preserve the wetlands, and the second was how do we access the site. And I think we have become, been through the through the efforts of the Conservation Commission, um, our conservation agent, and uh, Beta, and the applicant and their team have I think come to a pretty good uh, conservation plan for the wetlands portion and the wildlife portion. And the traffic side, I, I think, unfortunately, is not going to be as, as clear cut and is not as, as good a, an outcome. Um, but unfortunately, with, you know, we've had very limited possibilities for how we could address those, uh, those terms, and especially given the, the conditions of Lake Street um, and the inability to access Route 2 directly, which is something I know a lot of us had hoped we would be able to, to do um, early on in the process. So. I think for me, I would, you know, I strongly thank everyone uh, for all their efforts throughout this this whole process. Um, and <laughs> given given where we are with with this decision, I think we have um, come up with as strong and defensible decision as we can for this project. And um, I hope that we are able to pass it, and that we're able to uh, see it through to to its final fruition in a way that. It, is, it becomes um, an asset for this neighborhood and, um, and can do so going into the future. So with that, unless there's further discussion, uh, the board has a motion before it, uh, which is a motion to approve uh, the comprehensive permit for Thorndike Place. Um, as conditioned by the decision that's before us. And I'll just ask Mr. Haverty if there's anything else I need to add to that motion. I think that motion is fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. So then without further ado, I will take a vote of the board. Um, except I have to at this point. Um, so the, the board consists of five members. Um, we have two very excellent um, associate members of the board who have been with us for every single meeting since the start. Um, and unfortunately for them, they're not allowed to vote on the final decision because it's the vote of the board. But I did want to thank uh, both Steve Revelack and Aaron Ford for, for being here constantly uh, to making sure that when the and now that we're at the end, we would have still uh, five voting members present. So th I thank you both for that. Um, so for a vote of the board on the motion, 
Roger DuPont. Aye. Patrick Hanlon. Aye. Kevin Mills. Aye. John O'Rourke. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, so the comprehensive permit for Thorndike Place is approved as conditioned by the draft decision. Very good. So thank, thank you uh, to everyone who's taken a part in this process. I especially like to thank um, Paul Haverty, who has been with us since day one on this and uh, has been a tremendous Tremendous asset to us uh, keeping us on the straight and narrow. Greatly appreciated um, all your assistance with not only this one, but with also with the 1165 RMAS Ave, which you had helped us with also earlier in the year. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been my pleasure working with the board. Well, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, and thank we thank you very much also to um, uh, first and foremost to everyone in the. Uh, and the public who has taken a part in this process, um, really, it is a much better decision um, based on your input and your assistance and guidance uh, and allowing us to better understand your neighborhood and your neighborhood's needs. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, I'd like to thank our consultants, thank the Conservation Commission, our conservation agent, the Department of Planning and Community Development, uh, especially Director Jennifer Raid. Uh, and Kelly Linema, the assistant director, who've been invaluable to Dr. Paul. That's terrible. <laughs> uh, too much. At least we got the vote in. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Bring a, bring a project to the town. Christian, you cut out for the, about the last 15 seconds or so. Let me go again. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute, <laughs> mute Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, you're on mute. There we go. Hey. <laughs> All right. Internet's hey. trying to get me off as best it can. Um, so having voted on a final decision for Thorndike Place this evening's meetings, um, there are several changes coming to our board. So we have three members who are stepping down. Uh, Steve Revelack, who's been an associate member since April 2020, is stepping down at the conclusion of tonight's meeting. Uh, Aaron Ford, our other associate member who joined us in April 2020 is stepping down after tomorrow night's hearings. And they have both served us ably and faithfully throughout um, the board's most active and demanding period in recent history. Uh, the board and the town are grateful for your service with us here on the Zoning Board of Appeals. And Sean O'Rourke, who joined the board as an associate member back in April of 2017, and was elevated to a full member in September of that year, uh, will also be leaving the board um, in the coming weeks. It has been a great privilege having him serve on the Zoning Board of Appeals for the four and a half years. Uh, his wisdom and expertise will sorely be missed. Um, Mr. Revelak have, had asked if he could say a few words at the end of the meeting, which I will grant him the time to do. And if either uh, Mr. O'Rourke or Mr. Ford would wanna make any comments, I would allow them to do so as well. So Mr. Revelak? No, since... Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Since this is my last meeting as an associate member of the ZBA, uh, I just want to say that I'm really impressed at how um, much of a thoughtful, deliberative, and hardworking board this is. Uh, did I mention hardworking? <laughs> <laughs> um, it has been a privilege to uh, to serve with you and, and a great learning experience. Uh, I'd also like to give special recognition to uh, Mr. Klein and Mr. Hanlon, who've just done a tremendous job, um, you know, with the with our workload over this year and just managing it, just basically <laughs> keeping uh, keeping the train moving, so to speak. Uh, you two gentlemen are a real asset to the town, and we are lucky to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Very kind. 
I don't have any words prepared or anything, but um, I, I've enjoyed working alongside with all of you. Uh, I wish it was not remote and in person, but that's this way it's been. Uh, I've learned a ton, and had this been in a different part of my career where I had more time to commit to this, I wouldn't leave because it's a it's a good group, um, and it's a good cause. So th thanks for doing it, and I've enjoyed uh, working remotely with all of you. And I'm sure I'll see you around town. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Ford. You can always join up again later. <laughs> 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 well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and it's been great getting to know all of you. I guess my only regret's been with COVID because I enjoyed our uh, in-person meetings for sure, and it helped all of us as members get to know each other, uh, which was a ton of fun. Uh, the amount of work that people do on this board is incredible for a volunteer board, so thank you all. And the amount I've learned from all of you, Mr. Hanlon, Mr. Klein, Mr. DuPont, and even you, Mr. Mills, um, who I first got to know here in, at Arlington Little League. So it's been great seeing you again, Kevin. And uh, just thank you all very much. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. So with that, our traditional ending, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially wish to thank uh, Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Linema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. And tonight, especially uh, thank Jennifer Rate for salvaging this meeting and finding us a new room and getting us up and running again. Uh, that was invaluable and much appreciated. Uh, please note that the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by us will be available hopefully on ATMI um, at some point. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And if you have not had enough of the Zoning Board of Appeals, we will be back with you tomorrow night at 7.30 um, on this same channel. Uh, to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Revelack. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very, very much. Good night, everyone. Good night, John. Good night, Aaron. See y'all tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Good night, Steve. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.